the supply of money is a stock at a particular point of time though it conveys the idea of a flow over time the term the supply of money is synonymous with such terms as money stock stock of money money supply the supply of money at any moment is the total amount of money in the economy the most common view is associated with the traditional and keynesian thinking which stresses the medium of exchange function of money according to this view money supply is defined as currency with the public and demand deposits with commercial banks there are two theories of the determination of the money supply according to the first view the money supply is determined exogenously by the central bank the second view holds that money supply is determined endogenously by changes in the economic activity which affects people's desire to hold currency relative to deposits or the rate of interest etc thus the determinants of money supply are both exogenous and endogenous which can be described broadly as the minimum cash reserve ratio the level of bank reserves and the desire of the people to hold currency relative to deposits the last two determinants together are called the monetary base or the high powered money until the late 1960s the supply of money was treated as a policy variable determined by the monetary authorities monetary research in the theory of money supply made substantial advances thereafter which clarified the analytical underpinnings of the money supply process the supply of money is determined jointly by the public authority banks and the public in this determination the monetary authority plays an active and dominant role but that of public and banks cannot be ignored or taken for granted understanding this role is essential for a successful policy of monetary control in the context of developing countries and emerging market economies there are essentially two main approaches to money supply determination that is the money multiplier approach with its foundation in the works of friedman and schwartz in 1963 and kagan in 1965 and the balance sheet or structural approach the money multiplier approach focuses on the relationship between money stock that is m and reserve money that is h and through the money multiplier generally denoted by small m to the public's preference between currency demand deposits that is dd and time deposits that is td and to the banks holding of reserves as a proportion of aggregate deposits or liabilities while the structural approach favors analysis of individual items in the balance sheet 
of the consolidated monetary sector in explaining variations in money stock. The difference between them reflects the division between monetarists and non-monetarists. After studying this module, you shall be able to know how the supply of money is determined, learn about the various theories of its determination, identify factors that affect the money supply in an economy, analyze the process of money supply determination in the different approaches. Until the late 1960s, the supply of money was treated as a policy variable determined by the monetary authorities. The money supply in an economy is not policy determined, but determined jointly by the public, banks and monetary authorities. There are two theories of money supply determination, the money multiplier approach, which focuses on the relationship between money and reserve base, and the structural approach, which analyzes individual items in the balance sheet of the consolidated banking sector. The money multiplier model of the money supply has become the standard paradigm in the study of macroeconomics and money and banking to explain how the policy actions of the central bank influence the money stock. It also has been used in empirical analysis of money stock control and the impact of monetary policy actions on other economic variables. One important feature of this model is that it decomposes movements in the money supply into the part that is due directly to central bank policy actions that is the adjusted monetary base and the part that is due to changes in technology and the tastes and preferences of depository institutions and the public that is the money multiplier. In this decomposition, the multiplier is assumed to be independent of the policy actions of the central bank. The independence is implicitly predicted on the assumption that the demands for both checkable deposits and currency are determined by the same factors and that individuals can quickly and effectively alter their holdings of currency and checkable deposits to achieve the desired proposition of the two alternative forms of money. Let us now understand the difference between ordinary money M and high powered money H. M is the ordinary money produced by the RBI and the government. It is held by the public in the form of currency C and demand deposits DD. H is high powered money produced by the RBI and the government and held by the public in the form of currency C and by the banks in the form of reserves R. As a preliminary to the study of the theory of money supply, it is essential to understand the distinction between two kinds of money that is ordinary money M and high powered money H. The alternative empirical measures of money discussed in the previous modules were all measures of ordinary money M. Here we will define money narrowly as M is equal to C plus DD plus OD that is the sum of currency and demand deposits of banks including the RBI held by the public and since other deposits of the RBI are less than 1% of the total money supply, we ignore OD in the future discussion. This M is the money produced by the RBI, government and the banking system and held by the public. That is 
m is equal to c plus dd. High powered money that is h is the money produced by the RBI, government and held by the public and banks. It is also called reserve or base money. H is equal to C plus R plus OD that is H is the sum of currency held by the public C cash reserves of bank R and deposits of the RBI OD. Since OD are 1 percent of total H we ignore it and hence H is equal to C plus R. This definition of H is by its use or holders not by its producers RBI and the government. Now we will compare high powered money and ordinal money. If you compare ordinary money M is equal to C plus DD with high powered money H is equal to C plus R, you notice that currency C is common to both the expressions. But while M has demand deposits DD, H has reserves R. Obviously, the high poweredness of H comes from the presence of R in H. Every unit of R serves as the base for multiple creation of DD in a fractional reserve system where the entire H is called high powered because though at one point of time only R gives the high poweredness to H, yet currency C has the potential to become high powered the moment it is converted into DD. This then becomes the reserves of the bank and lead to multiple creation of DD which are a part of money and hence money also increases by multiple amount. Let us start with H theory of money supply. It is so called because H is found to be the dominant factor determining the money supply in the economy. At the outset, it is assumed that the supply of H by the RBI and the government is policy determined exogenously. The demand for H is equal to C plus R comes from the public's demand for currency C and bank's demand for reserves R. The public divides their holdings of money M between C and DD in a constant proportion which is called the currency demand deposit ratio. The banks also maintain a certain proportion of their deposits D in the form of reserves R. This ratio is denoted by R and is called the reserve ratio or reserve to deposit ratio. There is near unanimity among monetary economists around the theory of money supply that says that the single most important and dominant factor that determines money supply is H. For short, we shall call it the H theory of money supply for reasons that will become clear in the sequel. It is also called the money multiplier theory of money supply, but we prefer to call it the H theory because the entire theory is built around the demand and supply of H and the money multiplier is only an outcome of this approach, not its starting point. Calling it the H theory focuses attention on the key variable in the whole drama of money supply changes. It also provides the theory, the standard technique of demand supply analysis. We shall discuss the H theory in a very simple form. This will be enough to bring out the main contours of the theory and its basic and analytical thrust. We now discuss the components of reserves. It consists of two components. RR are the required reserves which the scheduled commercial banks in India are required to statutorily hold as balances with the RBI according to the statutory cash reserve ratio decided by the RBI. ER are the excess reserves of banks. They are the reserves of the banks in excess of the required cash reserves and are held by the banks for transaction, precautionary and speculative purposes. They are held by the banks either as vault cash or as balances with the RBI. 
since R is equal to RR plus ER, if we divide throughout by total deposits D, we get reserve ratio R is equal to the sum of the cash reserve ratio RR plus the excess reserve ratio E. Some economists do not take into consideration excess reserves in determining high powered money and consequently the money supply. But the monetarists give more importance to excess reserves. According to them, due to uncertainties prevailing in banking operations as in business, banks always keep excess reserves. The amount of excess reserves depends upon the interaction of two types of costs. The cost of holding excess reserves and the cost generated by deficiency in excess reserves. The first cost is in terms of the market rate of interest at which excess reserves are maintained. The second cost in the terms of the bank rate which is a sort of penalty to be paid to the central bank for failure to maintain the legal required reserve ratio by the commercial bank. The excess reserve ratio varies inversely with the market rate of interest and directly with the bank rate. Since the money supply is inversely related to the excess reserve ratio, decline in the excess reserve ratio of banks tends to increase the money supply and vice versa. Thus, the money supply is determined by the high part money, the currency ratio, the required reserve ratio and the market rate of interest and the bank rate. The monetary base or high powered money is directly controllable by the central bank. It is the ultimate base of the nation's money supply. Of course, the money multiplier times the high powered money always equals the money supply. That is capital M is equal to small m into capital H. This formulation tells us how much new money will be created by the banking system for a given increase in the high part money. The monetary policy of the central bank affects excess reserves and the high part money identically. Suppose the central bank makes open market purchases. This raises the high part money in the form of excess reserves of banks. An increase in money supply that results from it comes from the banking system which creates new money on the basis of its newly acquired excess reserves. Thus, this concept tells us that the monetary authorities can control the money supply through changing the high powered money 
or the money multiplier. We now look at the components of total deposits D. They are composed of demand deposits DD and the time deposits TD, both held by the public. The public divides their total deposits between DD and time deposits in a constant proportion T. In equilibrium, the demand for H is equal to supply of H. Now look at the components of H from the demander's side that is, currency C demanded by the public and demand for R coming from the banks that is, H is equal to C plus R. Now substituting for C is equal to C, DD and D is equal to DD plus TD in the expression, we get we now substitute for TD is equal to TDD and R is equal to RR plus E to get the expression. This gives the expression for demand deposits. Now to determine the money supply in an economy, we substitute the values of C is equal to CDD into the money supply equation to get the value of the money multiplier as this makes money supply a function of C, RR, E, T and H. The money multiplier theory discussed so far helps us derive the demand deposit and money multiplier. The demand deposit multiplier given by tells us the multiple by which DD will increase when H increases by some amount. The money multiplier given by tells us the multiple increase in money when H increases by some amount. The criticism of the money multiplier theory are it is based on an identity just a description of movement in money stock rather than a behavioral theory. The money supply equation is an equilibrium condition rather than a money supply function and the process involved is rather mechanical. The analysis does not involve any interest rate changes. The money multiplier theory is not a part of theory of portfolio adjustment to relative price or yield changes. The reserve money is taken as given exogenously with no examination of factors determining its level. The money multiplier theory obscures rather than illuminates the fundamental process of money supply determination. Let us now discuss the criticism of the money multiplier approach in detail. The critics of the money multiplier theory have the following arguments. 1. The money multiplier approach is based on an identity, an analytically convenient tautology offering just a description of movements in money stock rather than a behavioral theory of its determination. Two, in its general form, capital M is equal to small m into capital H. It is an equilibrium condition rather than a money supply function and process involved is rather mechanical. The only facets of portfolio choice considered are those of the public in the determination of desired C by DD and desired TD by DD ratio and banks in the determination of R by D ratio. This is inadequate as the analysis does not involve or require any interest changes. 3. The theory of money stock determination should be treated as a branch of a general theory of portfolio adjustment in response to relative price or yield changes by taking the reserve money as given. The money multiplier identity short circuits this approach. Fourth, the reserve money is taken as ex exogenously given whose values are considered to be determined outside the system under consideration fixed by monetary authorities and no steps are taken to examine the factors determining its level. 
as a matter of fact level of reserve money is target that is control variables whose values the authorities attempt to set rather than an exogenous variable to treat the policy targets as exogenous variables implies that the authorities do not alter their control variables in response to the system the money multiplier identity obscures rather than illuminates the fundamental nature of the process of money stock determination there is essentially a divergence of views regarding the usefulness of money multiplier which could be traced to division between the monetarists and non monetarists the former argue cannot that the monetary authorities can exercise effective control over the stock of money while the latter question the feasibility of this exercise the controversy between them boils down to three issues one which of the variables can be controlled by the monetary authorities two if some of the variables are not controllable can monetary authorities offset inferences of such variables by using instruments at their disposal three are the behavioral functions explaining these variables stable and predictable according to the non monetarists not only are most of the variables entering the equation endogenous the behavioral functions explaining the determinants are also unstable and since the monetary authorities in the developing economies do not have potent policy instruments to offset the impact of changes in these variables on monetary stock and hence are not in a position to effectively control the process of money stock determination the monetarists agree that both real and financial sectors of the economy exert influences on the money stock but the behavioral patterns of the public and the banks are sufficiently stable and predictable so as to permit the monetary authorities to control the money stock the issue is therefore empirical and country specific depending on the stage of financial development of the economy as an alternative to the money multiplier theory we have the balance sheet approach which focuses on the disaggregated analysis of the balance sheet of the consolidated banking sector and like the money multiplier theory which focuses on the balance sheet of the central bank the essence of this approach lies in the examination of variations in money stock through an analysis of credit creation by the consolidated banking sector by credit given to the government commercial sector and movements in the foreign exchange asset holding etc the balance sheet of the consolidated banking sector shows on the liability side the monetary liabilities consisting of currency liability with the public deposit liabilities of banks and the other deposits with the rbi the other liabilities are the non monetary liabilities on the asset side we have the financial assets consisting of credit given to the government and the commercial sector changes in the holdings of foreign exchange assets of the banking sector and the government's currency liabilities to the public along with this we have the other assets by focusing on a disaggregated analysis of the consolidated banking sector the balance sheet approach obviates the need for a mechanistic appraisal of the money multiplier since broad money m3 comprises the monetary liabilities of the consolidated banking sector 
it follows from the asset side that M3 equals net bank credit to government plus bank credit to commercial sector plus net foreign exchange assets of the banking sector plus government's currency liabilities to the public minus net non-monetary liabilities of the banking sector. The, the essence of the balance sheet approach lies in the examination of variations in money stock through analysis of credit creation by the consolidated banking system through credit given to the government and the commercial sector and movements in the foreign exchange asset holdings etc. By focusing on disaggregated analysis of the consolidated banking sector, the balance sheet approach obviates the need for a mechanistic appraisal of the money multiplier. Critical issues of Goodhart's general equilibrium model are a. The size of the public sector deficit b. Market reactions to the authorities' open market operations c. The elasticity of substitution between foreign and domestic assets d. Interest elasticity of the demand for bank credit let us now understand the Goodhart's general equilibrium model. It works with the flow of funds identity, where PSD equals public sector deficit, OMO equals outcome of operations in marketable debt, NMD equals outcome of transactions in non-marketable debt, MAT equals use of funds to pay off maturing debt, ECF equals finance obtained from or required for accommodating external currency flows, change in H equals change in reserve money. The flow of funds identity is combined with a set of behavioral equations in the model covering the factors in a general equilibrium framework. The determination of money stock is seen as a process of general portfolio adjustment in response to relative interest rate changes. The time path of the process depends on the relevant speeds of adjustment of various sectors to relative price changes rather than the mechanistic process embedded in the money multiplier approach. This approach may have conceptual superiority but it is more relevant in a developed and fully liberalized financial system and not for an emerging market economy like India. Let us now summarize what we have studied in this module. There are two theories of the determination of the money supply, money multiplier approach and balance sheet approach or structural approach. The money multiplier approach focuses on the relationship between money stock and reserve money, while the structural approach favors analysis of individual items in the balance sheet of the consolidated monetary sector in explaining variations in money stock. The main difference between high powered money and ordinal money is inclusion of reserves in high powered money instead of man deposits. Every unit of reserves are serves as the base for multiple creation of demand deposits in a fractional reserve system. R consists of two component required reserve RR and excess reserve ER. The money multiplier theory has been criticized on various grounds. For example, some argued that it is based on an identity or it is just a description of movement in money stock rather than a behavior theory. As an alternative to the money multiplier theory, we have the balance sheet approach which focuses on the disaggregated analysis of the balance sheet of the consolidated banking sector unlike the money multiplier theory which focuses 
on the balance sheet of the central bank. The essence of this approach lies in the examination of variations in money stock through an analysis of credit creation by the consolidated banking sector like credit given to the government, commercial sector and movements in the foreign exchange, asset holding etc.